All right, here we go. Your first chapter and your first look into chemistry here. Uh, we'll start with some basics here, chemistry in our lives. What is chemistry? As you can see here, and, and maybe you know already, chemistry is the study of substances in terms of composition, structure, properties, and reactions. What else is it? It's also the study of matter. That's kind of the simple definition, the study of matter. What's, what's it made up of? How are the particles put together that made the substance? What are the properties and characteristics? And then how will that substance behave with others? That's chemistry and what you're about to learn in this class. Chemical reactions happen all the time. I'm sure you've had tons of them already today before you've even viewed this video. You can see the list here. I'm not going to read all these slides to you. That would be kind of boring. But as you can see, lots of things that happen every day all around you, sometimes with and sometimes without your involvement, are considered chemical reactions. Here's some more as well. Everything in our lives from materials to life involves chemistry. So even if we're not talking about reactions like we were on the previous slide, slide three, on this slide we're just talking about substances. Everything, even the air that we are breathing right now is a substance, involves chemistry. Check out your toothpaste. Holy cow, did you have any idea all this stuff was in your toothpaste? Well, you can see there's a name, a chemical name for each substance, and more importantly, a specific function that each one has. If you want to read through this, take a look. It's interesting, but they're all there for a reason. They don't just throw in a substance into toothpaste or into a cleaning product or into your shampoo without a specific reason. All right, so we're going to start by looking at the scientific method. And maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. Um, let's go through the steps here. So the method involves making observations. We start here. Forming a hypothesis. Doing experiments to test the hypothesis. And then based on those results, you either have to change your hypothesis if the experiments don't support it, or if your experiments do support it, you can go on to the last step with your theory. As you can see though, theory will be modified if additional experiments do not support it. So it can become a vicious cycle depending on what the results of those experiments are. Okay. So here's an example of the scientific method applied to your everyday life. And what I'm hoping that you realize here very quickly is that you've used the scientific method before. You probably didn't classify your steps like we're going to do here, but you've used it and you will use it for the rest of your life. Okay, so let's take a look at this look at this example. So you make an observation. The sound from your CD player, or from a CD, excuse me, in a CD player skips. All right, hypothesis number one, the CD or the player, one of the two, is faulty. Okay, so you try an experiment. When the CD is replaced with another CD in that same player, the sound from the second CD is played okay. Ah, well, so your hypothesis two, the original CD has a defect. Clearly the player doesn't because when the original CD is played in another player, the sound still skips. So you see what we did here? We did a couple of experiments. Now, in all reality, you may have stopped after experiment one and said, well, clearly the player's not at fault because I can play another CD. But just to verify that, you do another a second experiment, which is always a good idea. You do a second experiment and the CD still skips. All right, so your theory, the experimental results suggest that the original CD has a defect. All right, next thing we're going to look at, units of measurement. Okay, in chemistry, quantities are measured. Even in the, as you can see here, it looks like a nurse. Most of you want to be nurses. As a nurse, you're going to measure quantities. You may perform some experiments. In chemistry lab, we definitely perform experiments. You'll be performing experiments as well this semester. 
You'll calculate results. You will use numbers to report measurements, and then the results will be compared to standards. Okay, so for instance, in the measurement of the thickness of the skid fold at the waist, calipers are used. Caliper is a measuring tool used to compare some dimension of an object to a standard. Do you know what the caliper tool is used for in health science? Ah, if you don't, why don't you take a look when you get a chance to look that up. I bet as a nurse you'll be using these if you work in a doctor's office someday. Okay, every measurement, a number, has to be followed by a unit to have any meaning. Well, okay, so in math class, you probably worked a lot with numbers. Five, ten, maybe even fractions, one half. But in the science world, we don't just have numbers, we have measurements, which means a number has to be followed by a unit. As you can see here in this list, we've got numbers with their units. 35 meters, 0.25 liters, 20, 225 pounds, 3.4 hours. So again, it's so important, and I can't emphasize, especially when you're doing your labs, can't just have numbers. 35, if you just tell me 35, 35 what? 35 millimeters, 35 meters, or for instance, think about you're in the medical field, you're a nurse, and the doctor says, give the patient 35. You would have no idea what to do. Is that 35 pills? Is it 35 milligrams? Is it 35 cc's? Hopefully you get my point. Do you see how important these units are? All right, so that leads us to the metric system, the metric system. In the science world, we refer to it and talk about as well the SI, the international system. Did you know that most countries in the world use the metric system? We're one of the very, very few that doesn't. And unfortunately, what that means is, even as a college student, you may not be very familiar with it, not be comfortable using it, and so we have to spend time in the college chemistry classroom teaching you about it. Okay, but what about the metric system? Well, what's great about it? It's based on powers of 10. Powers of 10. All right, you're going to see what I mean here in just a second. So in length, here we go. Let's talk about length. Length is one measurement you'll be taking this semester. We can use we can measure length a couple of ways. You've probably used what we call a ruler, a ruler, um, but it may not have had centimeters, meters. It may not have been in the metric unit. But in the science lab, we use things like a meter stick. And a meter stick, as you can see, meter is the unit of length in both metric and SI systems. And here's what a meter stick, this is just a little bit, or this is actually one meter stick, but it's been shrunk down into, you know, fit on this page. All right, so inch. We're familiar with inches, and did you know one inch is equal to approximately 2.54 centimeters on a meter stick? So if you lined up a, a traditional you know, ruler like you might have um, in your desk at home next to a meter stick, you would see that those two, when you line them up, that's what they equal. One on the ruler, on your ruler, is equal to 2.54 centimeters. So what that means as far as an equality, one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. This is also what I would consider an English to metric conversion. English being we use inches, metric is in centimeter, centi being a prefix. Okay, volume. Volume is another measurement you're going to be taking a lot of this semester. The definition of volume, the space occupied by a substance, the, the unit of volume is liter in the metric system, and while you might not be familiar with liters, hopefully you've heard of quarts before. One liter is equal to 1.06 quarts, and, and maybe you are familiar with a liter. I bet everyone in, at one point or another, maybe even right now, has a two liter bottle of soda, or what we call pop here in Chicago, um, two liter bottle of pop sitting around, or you've seen one. That's two liters. All right, anybody can tell me the name of this thing? Do you know what that is right there that I'm pointing at? It's a graduated cylinder. 
and you're gonna be using this quite frequently in the lab. This one's a really large one. This one measures up to a thousand milliliters. We don't have anything nearly that large. Typically they're in 10 milliliters, that's kind of the baby. 50 milliliters, that's a middle size. And then we also have 100 milliliters that's used in the lab. All right, and then let's talk about mass. The mass of an object. It's the measure of the quantity of material it contains. The unit is grams or sometimes kilograms. Now, kilograms, in a doctor's office, typically um, patients are measured, their, their, their weights are measured in kilograms. So if you're already working in a hospital or doctor setting, you might be familiar with the kilogram. But gram is the base unit, and we're going to be using both in this class. All right, so here's a question for you. What's the difference between mass and weight? Hmm. Everything has mass, but depending on where you are, the weight can change. And that's because the weight is a result of the action of gravity. Gravity. Your weight on the moon would be a lot less, even though your mass remains the same. Okay, think about that. You're an astronaut. You go up into space. You go onto the moon where gravity is much, much, much less than it is here. That's why people float around. Your mass is still the same. The quantity of material inside your body hasn't changed just because you've gone from Earth to the moon. However, the weight, which is the measurement of that, has changed because there's a difference in gravity. All right, temperature, temperature. <clears throat> temperature is the measurement of how hot or cold a substance is. The Celsius scale is used in the metric system. We will also, in here, in the chemistry lab, use the Kelvin scale. Okay, we're not going to use Kelvin for a little while. We're going to start with it right now, and I'll show you the conversions, and we'll talk about it. But we're not going to see it again until we talk about gas laws. But regardless, you will see both in this class. Celsius is the temperature scale used in the metric system. And again, most countries, if you were to go to Belgium today, for instance, and watch their weather, you may not be able to understand what they're saying um, in Flemish, but the temperatures that re would be reported would look awful goofy, and that's because they're in Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Just to kind of give you an idea, 18 degrees Celsius is equal to 64 degrees Fahrenheit on this thermometer that's shown doo -doo -doo, right there. On the Celsius scale, the melting point of ice is zero, that's also called the freezing point, and the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. What is heat or cold? What does temperature really measure? Ah, we're going to talk about that as we go through the class. Time. Time is another measurement you'll be taking in the laboratory. The unit of second. Hey, we know that. We use seconds. Oh, well, that's one less unit to have to worry about uh, since we're familiar with it. The unit of second is used in the metric system. Time, though, is based on an atomic clock that uses frequency admitted by cesium atoms. All right, well, you don't really honestly have to worry about that. Uh, but there is an atomic clock. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe not, but it's okay. We're going to measure time in seconds, sometimes maybe minutes in the lab in this class. Okay, scientific notation. We have some numbers in this class. Okay, scientific notation. I'm hoping you're familiar with this from your math class, so we're going to do a quick overview. Why are we using scientific notation in a chemistry class? Well, because we're going to be doing things with very, very large numbers and sometimes quite small numbers, um, but our very large number will come into play when we talk about the thing called the mole. And every time you had to use, it's called Avogadro's number or the mole, if you had to write out all, there's a bunch, it's, not, it's, oops, it's even bigger than that, if every time you had to write out a number, you had to write, and look, it goes off the screen, and off we go, and go, 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 okay? Every time you had to use that number, you had to write that down or type it in your, comp or your calculator, man, that would be a pain. Well, scientific notation is a nice way to write very large or very small numbers in a condensed fashion. Now, does that mean you have to use it? Well, be careful. If the question asks for it in scientific notation, you need to, okay? Um, but one other note about scientific notation, we can also write any number in scientific notation. So for instance, the number 1.0, I could write in scientific notation, it's 1.0 times 10 to the zero power. Now, 
I realize that's a whole lot more work than just writing 1.0. But the point being, you don't have to use it just for a big number or a tiny, tiny number. You can use it for any numbers. Okay, and I apologize because my subscript and subscripts are not written very well here. This would actually be 8 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. You put the negative or the minus 6 as a superscript, and then 4.5 times 10 to the positive 6 seconds. That got thrown off there, okay? So it's all based on moving the decimal. Okay, so let's take a look at this. A number in scientific notation contains a coefficient and a power of 10. So the coefficient's this front number. Power of 10, oh, well, that's where the computer screwed up here. Sorry, guys. This should be 10 to the 10 squared and 10 to the minus 4, okay? So to write a number in scientific notation, the decimal point is always placed after the first digit. See my first digit, then the decimal? First digit, then the decimal. The spaces moved are shown then as a power of 10. So in other words, you count how many places over you move. And let me fix this real quick. 5.2 times 10 to the positive 4, 3.78 times 10 to the minus 3. There we go, okay? All right, <clears throat> here's some additional examples, okay? Move this here. So the number 10,000, what that means is it's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. 1 times 10 to the 4. 1,000 is 10 times 10 times 10, so 1 times 10 to the 3, and so on and so forth. You see where I'm going. But let me show you something here. So when you have a positive, a positive superscript there, that exponent, when they're positive, I think about it like, uh, like this. I would love to have ooh, this number in my bank account. That would be very positive. Large numbers, and I shouldn't even say lesser large numbers, but numbers greater than zero always have a positive power of 10. Always have positive. And as you'll see in a minute here what the negatives are and how they work. How do we do math? You guys, down here is some math. Okay, how do we do some math? Um, again, let me write this a little nicer. 10 to the minus 3 over 10 to the positive 5, that equals 10 to the minus 8. Now, in your calculator, let me show you something real quick. Depending on your calculator, you might have a button that says EE, okay? And what you would do, if you were putting a number in scientific notation in your calculator, let me, hang on, let me erase all this. If you were putting a number, let's say this number right here in your calculator, I would actually do it like this. One, whoops. Oh, come on, erase. Ah, okay. It's not letting me erase. Here's how I would do it in my calculator. Parentheses. One, then I'd hit the EE button. Negative three, close the parentheses, divided by one, hit the EE button. 5. Close the parentheses, hit equals. Always put your scientific notation numbers in parentheses in your calculator. Otherwise, your calculator can get confused. If, if the number in front is 1, if this is a 1, it won't happen. But when you use other numbers, which you'll use quite often, that's when it can really get screwed up. Um, and I'll show you some of the examples with those later. Um, but just remember, always put scientific notation in your calculator. And you can use either the EE or you may see some button that has a 10 to the X. Okay, a 10 to the X. And that would be on your log button on your calculator. And just remember, though, you don't want to use both. You have to pick one or the other. So you would do 1, 10 and the, to the x would be then negative you do 10 to the x, and then you'd put in a negative 3. This would be your button you'd hit. Don't forget your parentheses. And what I recommend you do right now, grab your calculator, try putting maybe even this whole thing in your calculator and hit equals, and verify that you get 1 times 10 to the minus 8. Now, your calculator may or may not be in scientific notation mode, meaning it may give you the really, 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 really tiny number, 
or it may give you the answer in scientific notation mode. I can't really speak over a video on how your individual calculators work, but typically they do have a mode function, M-O-D-E mode, and you can search for and put that in uh, scientific notation. It'll spit out answers for you in scientific notation mode. It's quite nice. So why don't you get your calculators out, hit pause on this, give this a try, make sure that you know how to use your calculator correctly before you even go any further. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about measurements. And we're going to practice just by using a ruler, or at least a virtual ruler, and measuring the length of this piece of wood. Okay, why, why in the world are we doing this? Well, you're going to see in just a second here. So without looking at all this down below, what do you think the, or what would you say the length of this ruler is? I'll give you a second. Well, what's the true answer? What would I want you to answer in the chemistry lab? It would be 4.56 centimeters centimeters. This is what you should report. Now let's talk about how you take this measurement accurately. So here's what we know. What's the first digit? Four. We know with certainty this piece of wood is greater than, is at least, four centimeters. And because of all these little hash marks, we can get a little bit better measurement than just saying it's, better, it's more than four. All right, well, reading the hash marks, I just marked all up. This is 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, 4 that's 4.5. I know it's greater than 4.5 centimeters, but not quite 4.6, because that's where 4.6 would be right there. So I hope we can all say together in agreement that this piece of wood is at least 4.5, but not, but not, not 4.6 centimeters, okay? So whatever you get that we would all agree with, okay? You write that, but then you go one step further. You estimate the last digit. Now, a lot of students will say, Dr. Liz, how many numbers past the decimal do you want? Well, that depends on the tool that you're using. And when you have different tools with different increments, or what we call hash marks here on the ruler, it's going to vary. So I can't just, I you cannot always say, oh, give me two past the decimal. It depends on the tool. And be really careful about that when you're in the lab. So this particular tool, this particular ruler, has hash marks every tenth of a centimeter. Point 0.1, every point 0.1, that's tenth, one tenth of a centimeter. So I know with certainty it's at least 4.5, and I'm going to estimate the last digit. Now, when you read that ruler up against that piece of wood, you may have said, I think it's 4.58, or maybe 4.54, or 4.59, excuse me. The last digit is going to be different depending on the scientist, that's you in this class, who's reading it. And that's okay. Okay, what, where would you be marked wrong if you didn't have the 4.5 with another number? Now, what if the piece of the wood had been right on the money, right on the 4.5 mark? Well, again, then you would have to add one more digit, 4.50, if you think it's right on the money, right on the 4.5. So, again, you use the tool, you use the increments noted, in this particular case, it's every 0.1 centimeters, and then you go one more past it. No more, no less, just one more. So there's always one uncertain digit, and that's the last one that you write down. The one that maybe your lab partner or someone else in the class would estimate to be a little different than you, and that's okay. So where are we going with all this? The significant digits include all digits with no uncertainty plus one estimated digit. That's what I just ta taught you about. We knew 4 and 4.5. We knew these first two questions here. No uncertainty. Based on the tool, based on this ruler, I knew with certainty this was at least 4.5. I estimated the very last digit, which happens to be the 100th place here on this ruler. 
All right, take a look here. See if you can estimate. Oh, this isn't a great ruler. I apologize. But see if you can estimate the length of the red line. This is 18 centimeters, 19 centimeters. This. Oh, wait, wait. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. I'm reading my own ruler wrong. Let me erase that. Ah, see these things happen. So this is supposed to be a hash mark. Okay. This is eight centimeters, nine centimeters, and this one's 10 centimeters. So give you a second, pause this, and see if you can estimate what where this red line ends up. You assume it started back here on the left at the zero. So how long is this red line? Again, hit pause, think about this. This is important that you practice this now, and then come back. Okay. So like the piece of wood, let's use our ruler and figure out what we've got. I know with certainty this is at least 9, because here's the 9, point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4. It's at least 9.4. It's definitely not 9. This would be 9.5. Nowhere near that. And so 9.4 is what we should all be in agreement with. Those are the un or excuse me, those are the certain Without, there's, there's no uncertainty, it is all certain, we all should agree, based on the ruler and the increments, it's at least 9.4. But we know it's not 9.5, the question is, where does it lie between there, between those two? And that's where we can all maybe beg to differ a little bit, let's say. I'm going to call it right around 9.41. Maybe you think it's 9.40, and that's okay. I think that answer right there is off. Our red line is slightly, slightly off a little bit. So based on the way everything put together when I put this slide together, my red line shifted a little bit. So I would say it's somewhere around 9.40. Here's the most important part, guys, and that is based on this ruler, based on this ruler and the hash marks, that you read it two past the decimal. For all those that are tempting to tempted to ask me, how many past the decimal? That's how many. Okay. What about rule number two? Sorry, they came off here. And that is for zeros. For zeros. What happens with the zeros? Well, zeros can be in one of many places. They can be at the end of a number. Let me write down lots of examples here. They could be at the beginning of a number or they could be in the middle of a number, or technically measurements since I added a unit. So we can have, these would be called beginning zeros. The, these zeros in this measurement would be middle zeros, and these two are ending zeros. So if you read a measurement or a number like you would a sentence from left to right, that's where this, I call, that's where this categorization comes from. If I read 0 0.003, I'm reading the zeros at the beginning of my sentence. That's why I call them beginning zeros. 103, those are middle zeros, middle meaning between two non zeros. And then ending zeros, the numbers or the measurements end with zeros. Okay, so first it's important to classify what type of zero you have a beginning, a middle, or an end. Beginning zeros are never considered significant. Never. So in other words, in 0 0.003 meters, there's only one sig fig, the three. We'll talk about that in a second. In middle zeros, middle zeros are always significant. So, that being the case, how many sig figs do you think the measurement 103 meters has? That's right, three. And then my ending zeros. Ending zeros, these are the confusing ones, are sometimes significant. And you go, Dr. Liz, what in the world? Well, let me write out my rule, then we'll talk about it. So let's talk about the sig figs. 
with my ending zeros. So you'll notice, and you may have wondered, why did you give two examples of ending zeros? Well, notice one measurement has no decimal place, 10,000 meters versus 10,000 with the decimal meter. You go, isn't that still 10,000 meters? Well, when we talk about sig figs, no, it's very, very different. 10,000 meters, the first one, the ending zero, no decimal, no decimal, no significance to those zeros. So the only significant digit in the measurement 10,000 is the one at the beginning. 10,000 with a decimal and then a zero at the end. Ending zeros, yes, decimal, yes, they're significant. So all six of these digits are significant in this measurement. And you go, what? This makes no sense. Well, here's the deal, guys. 10,000 with the decimal and the zero. You're telling me you measured whatever it is. It's a really long distance or length, but you measured it with such certainty that you put a decimal and a zero. You know it's exactly 10,000 meters, and you measured it. That's why all six uh, digits are significant. But if you just tell me 10,000 meters... All you're telling me is it's around, it's approximately in the ballpark of 10,000 meters. You don't tell me if you're above, below, you're just kind of in the ballpark. And so all we know for certain is that the once number in the front, it's around 10,000, give or take. Think about this again in another light, like your bank account. If I were to ask you how much money's in your bank account, and you told me, I don't know, I've got around 500 bucks in my bank account. The only significant figure would be the five, because that's all you know with certainty is it's around 500. But if you told me you had $503.22, guess what? Now all five digits are significant. Why? Because you've used a tool recently, like probably the computer, and logged in and looked at your bank account and you know exactly how much is in there. So all five of these are significant. Let me give you one more example to throw at you here. One more example. You want to be a nurse. Nurses take patient's temperatures. If the doctor asks you to take the patient's temperature and you tell the doctor the patient's temperature, hang on, let me erase all this here. The patient's temperature is around 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that might be okay for your doctor. Your doctor might not be too upset about that. But in reality, you should measure the patient's temperature using a thermometer. And a thermometer is not just going to say 98. A thermometer is going to give you numbers past the decimal, maybe two, depending on your individual thermometer. And so if you were to measure the patient's temperature and take a recording and put it in the computer or tell it to the doctor, I would hope that you would put down exactly what the thermometer told you, 98.72 degrees Fahrenheit. And technically, if you were rounding this to two sig figs, you'd actually tell the doctor it's around 99. Okay? But again, what's the best one? That right there. If your thermometer measures digitally a patient's temperature and it's 98.72, that's what you should record. And that same rule is going to apply when you use the thing called the balance in lab, you're going to write down all the digits that's given because it's electronic. <clears throat> okay, so here's a sample slide for you, some practice. Based on my rules on the last one, see if you can figure out what this is, what the answer to each of these are. I've given you the first one, and that was probably the easy one. 38.15 has four sig figs. I want you to hit pause, I want you to try these other four examples, and then hit play when you're ready and check your work. Okay, you're back. 5.6 feet has two sig figs. 120.55, okay, remember the zeros, those pesky zeros. That's a middle zero. Middle zeros are always significant. So the total of five sig figs in that measurement. 0 0.0055 inches, only the two fives are considered significant. Oh, and that reminds me. I had said, told you I was going to explain why beginning zeros are never significant. Well, here's why. Beginning zeros can be placeholders. 
If you were to take 0 .0055 inches and write it in scientific notation, you would write it as 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 3. And notice here, sig figs in a scientific notation number, there are the digits written over here on the left. So written this way, it's probably more obvious that there's two. Written this way, whoops, the zeros again, beginning zeros are never significant. They're just considered placeholders. Only the two fives or a total of two sig figs for that measurement. And then last but not least, 1,200 meters, ending zeros, no decimal, no count. So again, only two sig figs. And again, if I were to write this in scientific notation, that's what it would look like. Okay. This also, you guys, gives you a good, good um, revision or, or another look at scientific notation. Remember, small numbers have negative superscripts or exponents. Positive or um, numbers greater than one, numbers greater than one have positive. So, like this is what I'd like to have in my bank account. This is a positive exponent. This is a number. Ooh, that would be a negative bad thing. Doesn't mean a negative number. The negative and the positive just indicate which direction you moved the decimal. Okay, that's all. Okay, let's take a look at this. Examples of some exact numbers. So exact numbers are obtained by counting or by definition. They are things that you will see in conversion. I like to call them conversion charts. Maybe sometimes like this. You're, you should already know. Have that in your head. One foot equals 12 inches. That came from counting the inches on a, on a ruler that's one foot, foot in length. Measured numbers are obtained by using some kind of tool to get there. Okay, so these guys, equalities, I also like to call conversion factors. <clears throat> Those are exact numbers, and just FYI, when you're doing problems and you're doing trying to deal with sig figs you don't use the numbers the measurements in these equalities or these conversion factors in determining sig figs the sig figs in a problem would always be based on the measurement that you obtained so for instance if i measured something to be 3.2 feet and i wanted to know how many inches were in that sig figs rules there's two sig figs in the measurement you took there should be two sig figs in your answer all right, let's see how you did at this. Gold melts at 1,064 degrees Celsius. This would have to, this measurement would have to be obtained through the use of, oh, that was a terrible M, through the use of a thermometer. That's right. So that's a measurement. One yard equals three feet. That's an exact number. That was an equality. Notice the equals sign. They're equal. The diameter of a red blood cell is 6 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters. Well, you'd have to measure that. There are six hats on a shelf. You would get that through counting. You'd count six hats sitting up there on the shelf. That's an exact number. And the atom sodium has 11 protons and 12 neutrons. Ooh. Well, protons and neutrons are way too tiny to count, but it is based on counting so we'd call that an exact number. All right. <clears throat> in calculations, as I just gave you that example a minute ago with your 3.2 feet into inches, but let's really start looking at this now. In calculations, answers must have the same number of sig figs as the measured. That's the key there. Measured. Measured number. Rounding. When you're going to round, when the first digit is dropped is four or less, the retained numbers remain the same. So everybody should know about rounding, right? If I have this, let's say it comes on my calculator, but I only need three sig figs. So I need these three to keep. I have to look at what am I dropping? Whoops. Okay, I'm dropping three. Okay, three is less than four or it's in the four or less category so it just drops off altogether and it becomes 4.58 but if you're dropping a digit that's five or higher you increase you round up so 2.4884 if your calculator spit that out but you have to give the answer with only two sig figs these are the first two sig figs the 2.4 so you're looking to drop everything to the right of that big line. Well, but the first digit is what you look at, and it's an 8. 
8 is gr 5 or greater rule, so you would round this up to 2.5. 2.5. All right, how about multiplication and division with sig figs, with sig figs? <clears throat> You're going to be doing a lot of multiplication and division in this class. Most problems we, we will be doing involve multiplication and division, and this one's not too bad. So, for instance, I'm multiplying these two numbers together. Your calculator gives you this answer, but what should you report as your final answer? What should you put it online on your homework or your quiz? Well, here's what you got to look at. The two numbers that you just multiplied, how many sig figs do they have? This first one, 110.5, is four sig figs. 0 0.048 is two sig figs. So you always go with the fewest sig figs. So two is less than four. Your final answer should have just two sig figs. And then obviously apply your rounding rules. So I cut it here. And what I'm dropping is a zero, so that is your rounding rule, you round down, you just leave it as 5.3. All right, addition and subtraction. This one comes into play primarily when you're doing conversions of temperature, like Fahrenheit to Celsius, Celsius to Kelvin. But how do you do it? Well, there's a little bit different rule here. And this is now you look at number of past the decimal. So you can see the example here, 2.52 and 1.34. 2.52 has 1 past the decimal, 1.34 has 2 past the decimal. Your calculator is going to tell you 26.54, but the answer that you plug in on the computer, the answer you report on your lab, can only have 1 past the decimal. So you're all, again going with fewest, but on the last slide it was fewest number of sig figs. On this one it's fewest decimal places. Okay? All right, for each calculation, round the answer to give the correct number of decimal places. Sorry, I'm not sure what's going on. My slide looks a little funky here. So 235.05, let me plug this in my calculator plus 19.6 plus 2. <clears throat> My calculator tells me that that adds up to 256.65. That's what my calculator says. However, my final answer should only have a number, in fact, it should have nothing past the decimal. That's because of this guy right here. This one had two digits past the decimal. This had one past the decimal. This had none past the decimal. So my answer should have no digits past the decimal. And based on what I'm dropping, notice your rounding rules apply. I'm dropping something that's five or higher, so you round up to 57. All right, and I can't read B. Maybe you guys can read it. It's not coming through on my little tablet here. So let me make one up. 5.101 multiplied by 300. Okay, we'll call this letter B because I can't see B. All right, let's plug that in the calculator. My calculator spits out 15.303. Now, multiplication and division rules state you look at total sig figs. 5.101 has four sig figs, 300 only has one. Notice no decimal, the ending zeros, no count. So four versus one, one is the lower number, the fewest sig figs. So this answer, when I report it as my final answer, can only have one sig fig. Ooh, this one's going to be tricky. Do you know what 15.303 is going to be reported as the final answer? 20. Okay. So one sig fig, that's where I draw my line. What I'm dropping is just to the right of it, and it's a five. Remember your rounding rules, five or higher, you round up. So 15.303 rounds all the way up to 20. Be careful, do not put a decimal after the 20, because that would make the ending zero significant. Two zero, 20 without a decimal is only, only has one sig fig. All right, <clears throat> let's look at these prefixes that decrease the size of a unit. So these are, this is the metric system, and we're looking at the prefixes, like milli and centi and deci. In other words, these are tiny little things. So in one meter stick, like what's up here, what's up here on our slide, this is one meter. 
one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. So centis are really tiny little things. Can you see how the deci would work? One meter equals 10 decimeters, and one meter equals 1,000 millimeters. Now, you go, but Dr. Liz, that doesn't match what's whoops, up here. Well, that's because <clears throat> you could flip it around, and I can say that one decimeter is equal to 0 0.1 meters. Do you see how that works? Let me erase this. Let me erase all this and write it again. So you can write an equality in one of several ways. For the decimeter, I can say that one meter has 10 decimeters within it, or I could say that one decimeter, if I want to make that my one, it's equal to one-tenth of a meter. Okay? So you'll see that when you look at um, different conversion tables and metric prefixes. It'll be written in one of two ways. Sometimes it's written both ways. Now something else to note, again, the, the metric system, deci. I can be talking about a base unit of meter, or I can be talking about a base unit of liter, or I could be talking about grams. The, the great thing about the metric system, these prefixes apply to any, any, any measurement. Length, volume, mass, the numbers all work out the same. So for instance, I could say one gram is equal to 10 decigrams. Or I could say 0.1 grams is equal to one decigram. The numbers remain the same and it's all based on a power of 10. So watch the slide and take a look. <clears throat> okay, then we have pre prefixes that increase the size of a unit. So in other words, they're really big things. Like a kilo, you would measure a patient's mass in kilograms, or you would drive distances in kilometers. On that previous slide, deci, centi, milli, those are little things. Like in a mass, you might give a patient a dosage of a medicine in milligrams. Okay, you measure... Small things with the small prefixes, you measure big things with the big prefixes. All right, take a look at this and the rest of the recording. I've got additional um, words and see what you think. Okay, so equalities. I've already been talking about and using the term equality. It states the measurement in two different units and it can be written using the relationship between the two metric units. So, for instance, one meter is the same as 100 centimeters and a thousand millimeters. So here I have written out the equality. One meter equals a hundred centimeters and one meter equals a thousand millimeters. Now, these fractions written down here, let me write them out a little nicely. These are the equalities. These guys down here are the conversion factors. Okay. So that means up here, this is what they equal. Down here, this is how you're going to use it in a problem, okay? I can also do it like this. Um, here's something you're familiar with using the English system. One foot is equal to 12 inches, right? That's the equality. Written as a conversion factor, depending on your problem, you would either use this fraction. This would allow you to go from inches into feet. Or, if you had a problem that gave you feet and you wanted to know how many inches, you would use that one. Okay? <clears throat> and they're also equal to each other. All right, volume. Let's take a look at volume here. <clears throat> volume is a little confusing for some students. It has the dimensions of a length cube. So a cube has length times width times height. Okay, and that's why sometimes, depending on the units used, you will see that volume has a cubic, cubic unit. So for instance, this cube up here is one centimeter long, one centimeter wide, and one centimeter high. One times one times one is one, but the unit would be cubic centimeters. One cubic centimeter happens to be equal to one milliliter, by the way. That's a very useful, handy conversion that you'll want later. Several equalities can be written for mass. 
You could say, for instance, one kilogram equals a thousand grams. You could say one gram is equal to a thousand milligrams. And you can even say one milligram is equal to 0 0.001 grams. Again, metric system, the prefixes are the same whether you're talking about volume or length or mass. Okay, one kilo equals 1,000 of whatever the base unit is. All right, here are some common equalities. These are, um, <clears throat> I have both the US or English, sometimes I call it, the metric column here in the middle, and then here's some metric to US conversions. This is for length, okay? Now, keep in mind in this class, when you need to look up conversions, some, like maybe this one, some you'll know in your head. Some you'll probably get to know as you do this class a lot, do a lot of problems in the class, you might eventually know them. And some you may have to look up, okay? And that's okay. Remember, open book, open note on most of your stuff. So look up conversions if you're not sure of them, or even if you are sure. You'd hate to get it wrong later when you had access to the tables and things like that. So use what you've got. Here are some conversions for volume. Okay, here are some conversions for volume. And then let's look at this question down here. An injured person loses 0.3 pints of blood. How many milliliters of blood would that be? Okay, so what I like to call the given 0 0.3 pints. Unknown, what we're solving for is that in milliliters. Okay, so I've got to find a conversion that allows me to go from pints to milliliters. And you may find one but you might also have to go through another unit to get there, okay? And so what's showing you right here? <clears throat> One quart equals two pints. Well, that doesn't quite help me exactly. I've got pints in there, but who said anything about quarts? Well, one quart is equal to 946 milliliters. So this problem would be one like, for instance, if I had asked you how many seconds are in a day, or maybe how many seconds are in two days, you'd have to go from days to hours, hours to minutes, minutes to seconds. You would need a couple of equalities to get there. Well, this is the same, same way. If you don't have a direct one step, one equality, how many pints is equal to how many milliliters, you can do it in several steps. You can go from your 0 0.3 pints, that's your given, you always start with that, I know I'm going to do this in two steps before I get my milliliters answer. And then, notice what I'm doing here. Pints is what I'm given. So I'm going to, step one, get rid of pints. And from pints, I had quarts, because I found that conversion. Pints on top, pints on bottom. That's why I put it on bottom, so it'll cancel. Step two, I'm going to go quarts into milliliters. So quarts on bottom, milliliters on top. Quartz on top, quartz on bottom, and that cancels, which is good. I didn't want an answer in quartz. Notice, before I plug any numbers in, I have all my units canceling except for what I want, and it's on top. It's in the numerator, which is good. That's where I want it. Now let's plug the numbers in, okay? One quart was equal to two pints. That came from here. And one quart is equal to 900, can I squeeze it in, and 46 milliliters. Okay, that came from there. Now, how do we do the math? Well, you can think of your given also as a fraction if you want. It's 0.3 over 1, because that's still 0.3. You multiply across the top, and then you divide if it's on the bottom. So it's going to be 0.3 times 1 times 946, all divided by 2. My calculator spits out 141.9 milliliters. Ah, be careful, however. Whoops, I screwed this up. Be careful. Sig figs. That's what my calculator tells me, but the answer I want to report should only have two sig figs. I would round that down, because I'm talking about then dropping to the right of my line. 141.9 is going to round down to 140 mils to have just the two sig figs. Again, I go back to the measurement in the problem, 0 0.30 pints of blood. Beginning zeros never count. Ending zeros count. Yes, decimal. Yes, count. 
So three and the zero are my two significant figures. My answer should have two. And there's my answer with two sig figs. All right, and I'm hoping you can see the top of my table. It's not showing up for me here. But again, some equalities. I've got metric mass. I've got English or U.S. mass. And then I have metric to U.S. Okay? And then a problem down below. And this one, I want to see if you can use the same idea, same principle, what I just did in the last problem, going from the pints of blood to milliliters of blood. See if you can convert 200 pounds into kilograms. Okay. And this one's even easier because I'll tell you, here's the equality. Well, it's up here as well. One kilogram equals 2.20 pounds. So you can do this in one step, one step. But remember, apply the same principle be before. Whatever you're given, you start with. That unit you put on bottom in your conversion factor, whatever you want, kilograms, put on top. All right, you check it out. Try to work it out. Hit pause, come back, hit play when you're ready to go. Okay, I'm hoping you got an answer of 90.9 kilograms. Now, I'll tell you something, I'll be honest. Sig figs, if you're telling me 200 pounds, that's only one sig fig. Your answer should really only have one sig fig, and that would be, without the decimal, 90 kilograms, okay? Okay, <clears throat> here's another one for you. The thickness of the skin fold at the waist indicates an 11% body fat. How much fat is in a person with a mass of 86 kilograms? Okay, so 11% body fat means for every one kilogram, or excuse me, 11 kilograms, you, you would have fat out of 100 kilograms of body weight. So let me write this over here. There's 11 kilograms of fat for every 100 kilograms of body, body weight or body mass. That's what 11% means. Give yourself the number 100. 11 out of the 100 would be fat. This is fat. Yuck, this is total. Okay, so you use that equality as your conversion factor. If you have a patient with a mass of 86 kilograms, what percent, or excuse me, using the percent, how many kilograms of that is fat? Well, the conversion, kilogram goes on bottom, kilograms total, or body mass on bottom. Kilograms fat goes on top, because that's what we want. Multiply if it's across the top, divide if it's on the bottom. And out of that 86 kilograms of body mass, 9.5 kilograms is fat. All right, density. One of the last things we're going to look at here, density. Density, the definition, compares the mass of an object to its volume, is the mass of a substance divided by the volume. So what in the world? Well, here's the equation. But what that means is how much mass an uh, a substance occupies in a given volume of space, or in a particular volume of space. Okay. Now, what's this cool little beaker right here? Years ago, maybe some of you are familiar with David Letterman. David Letterman used to have a segment, will it sink or will it float? And he had this huge pool and he would throw things in and you would, he would, his guests would predict ahead of time if substances would sink or float. Well, in a beaker, in a swimming pool of water or any liquid, the substances that sink, most people would say, well, they're really, really heavy. Things that floated were very, very light. And that's what most people think. The truth is this idea of sinking versus floating is based on density, not just mass, but it takes into account mass in a given volume of space. So the things that sunk had a greater, higher density than water. The things up here that were floating had a lower density than water. That's what it was all about. Or that's what this beaker is about. If you don't know who David Letterman is or you don't know what his sinking and floating thing is. Okay, so to do density, you need mass and volume of your substance. Typically, mass is in grams. Typically, volume is in milliliters or cubic centimeters. And remember, one milliliter equals one cubic centimeter, so the numbers would still be the same if you worked them out. Density, however, can be in any unit of mass and volume, but the problem would have to be specific and tell you or ask you for a specific. 
Here are some densities of very common substances. You can kind of look at them all. Go, okay, yeah, big deal. Um, we need this when we're working problems, okay? So, <clears throat> oftentimes. Osmium is a very dense metal. What is its density in grams per cubic centimeter if, so I'm looking, whoops, looking for density. If I have a mass of 50 grams with a volume of 2.2 cubic centimeters. Oh, and look how nice I was. The problem gives you mass in grams, volume in cubic centimeters, and that just happens to be what I'm looking for. So this one should be pretty simple, plug and play. My mass is 50 grams, my volume is 2.2 cubic centimeters. So when I plug that in my calculator, I get a density of 22.727272, it runs off the page. And I'll do my units here in a second. Let's look at sig figs though. Let's look at sig figs. The problem, the answers over here don't have correct sig figs. Let's do this in terms of correct sig figs. 50.0 grams. How many sig figs does that have? Three sig figs. Remember, ending zeros will count because I have that all-important decimal. 2.20, that one should be easy. There's two sig figs. So your answer should just have two sig figs. Draw my line after the two, but look at what the first digit is. I'm dropping a seven, which means I'm gonna round this up to 23 grams per cubic centimeter. <clears throat> the density of a zinc object can be calculated from its mass and volume. So you're probably gonna do this in the lab. When we have an irregular shaped object, so something where it's not a cube and I cannot just measure length times width times height, and it's something that'll sink in water, a really easy way to determine volume of an irregular shaped object is to do the following. Grab a graduated cylinder and get some water in it. I don't really know why it's blue water. We know water typically tends to be clear, but they've colored it up for whatever reason. Okay, nonetheless, the graduated cylinder on the left has just water in it. And like when you get into a bathtub and the volume rises, when, you add, when we add this piece of zinc, the level rises. And this is called volume by displacement. Volume by displacement. And it only works for irregular shaped objects that will sink when you put them into water. Okay. So the volume of the zinc is the difference between the before and after levels on the graduated cylinder. Can you figure out what that is? 45 minus 35.5? That's 9.5. The volume of this piece of zinc is 9.5 milliliters. Okay, mass came off the balance. 68.6, I don't know why the zero is not there. You report everything that the balance says. So 68.60 grams divided by 9.5 milliliters, and you get a density of this guy of 7.2. All right, that wraps up this, this segment. Um, one other thing to throw at you, you can also use density as a conversion factor. So if you know, for instance, let me just throw this up here in the upper right-hand corner. If you know the density of a substance, for instance, this piece of zinc is 7.2 grams per milliliter, what that really means is 7.2 grams per one milliliter. So for every one milliliter of zinc that you have, it will have a mass of 7.2 grams. You can use this equality just like you would use 12 inches equals one foot and convert between things. So in other words, the density, if given the density and asked to solve for volume or mass, you use the density as you would an equality and convert. Okay, now I'm really ending, leaving you for the time being.